Welcome to our first video on loads. Loads is another word for forces that we put on structures. Some of these are dead weight associated with the structural elements themselves. Some of it has to do with the dead weight of structure and other permanent elements added to the building. Some of it has to do with live load of people walking around on floors, snow load on the roof, lateral forces on the building due to wind in all directions, wind suction on the roof. And finally, seismic forces. Those are the primary things that we have to design for. In order to understand loads, we have to have some sort of units of measure uh, that we use to characterize them. So that's the topic of our first lecture. Um, we have something called force, which is a push or a pull and we express it in units either of pounds. So for example, um, we use this pound uh, symbol or the expression LBS uh, for pounds. And then we also use uh, the term kilopounds, which we abbreviate to KIPS or uh, sometimes just a capital K. In the metric system, uh, force is expressed in Newtons um, but for our purposes, we're going to stick in the uh, English system of units. The symbol that we use for a force is either uh, uppercase P or an uppercase W. So if it's a weight, we can use the symbol W. Uh, for any other forces, we can use P. Um, P, by the way, is a very unusual force symbol. If you study physics, you know F equals MA is the formulation of Newton's law, and um, we use the symbol F for force. In our work, though, we're going to use the term P, which stands for point force. And there is no such thing as a point force, because if you had a finite force on zero area, there's no material that can sustain that and therefore there's no way to apply such a force. But by point force we mean a force that's highly localized in all directions. So even though it's not on a point, it's in a very localized area. We can talk about a line distributed force which typically might be along the top of a beam or along the top of a truss or any other uh, spanning member. And the idea is that we want to know the load along that member in pounds per foot or kips per foot. And we use the symbol lowercase w. So note the distinction, which can get very confusing. Uppercase w is a highly localized force. Lowercase w is a line distributed force expressed in pounds per foot or kips per foot. We can have an area distributed force, and here life gets even more confusing. Um, this is sometimes characterized as a pressure or a stress. Um, and by the way, let me go back here and make this point. If we have a line distributed force, we'll show a series of arrows, and we do this because we don't know any other way to do it. We want the arrows to show the directionality but we want to imply that these are not discrete forces, that in fact we have a continuum of force along this line or along the top of the beam or whatever it may be. And we express that by connecting the ends of these arrows with a continuous line. And that continuous line is intended to be read as these are not discrete point forces, but are a, this is a continuum of force distributed along the line. Likewise, when we talk about pressure, we talk about a force distributed over an area. And again, we have this dilemma that we want to show directionality. So we put arrows, but we can't put an infinite number of arrows. We want to show a continuum. So we've connected this whole row of arrows with a continuous line. We've connected this row of arrows along the back with a continuous line. And those lines are intended to suggest that in fact, this is a continuum distribution of uh, force over the area. Now, lowercase p stands for pressure. Um, F, lowercase f, is sometimes used as stress. And typically that's 
sort of taking from the notion of some kind of area distributed force. And then S is also used for stress. So for example, in computer programs like multi-frame, uh, stress is expressed as S. S unfortunately also talks about a cross-sectional property, uh, so that can get kind of confusing, but usually you can tell from the context whether we're talking about a stress or a cross-sectional property. In some books, stress is even expressed as lowercase sigma from the Greek alphabet, but we're not going to use that in our work here. Um, we'll generally use P for an area distributed stress like a live load on a floor. When the stress becomes pretty intensive, we may use lowercase f, such as the internal stress in a beam. Finally, we can have a volume distributed force. So gravity acts on objects, um, and that force is distributed through the ob object. And now this becomes a complete mess trying to depict this with arrows but you sort of get the sense with all the continuous lines there that this is a smooth and continuous distributed force. We use uppercase D, um, which uh, comes from the expression density. So this is a volume distributed force. This is expressed in pounds per, per cubic foot or pounds per cubic inch or kilopounds per cubic foot. And likewise, pressure is expressed in pounds per square foot or pounds per square inch. Now again I want to emphasize this is this is a mathematical abstraction. There's no such thing as a point force. Everything is distributed. A pressure for example you can experience what a pressure feels like or a stress when you lean against the wall and you can feel the wall pushing back on you. So there is um, a continuum of distribution and the stress in your hand tells you where it's most intense. And by the way, for every patch where, you're, where your hand is touching the wall, the pressure of your hand on the wall is absolutely equal to the pressure of the wall on your hand over that little patch. Now, when we go to design structures, um, Every once in a while, we'll have a really localized force, like it's approximating a point force. And where floors are concerned, this is this is it. So you can imagine, uh, you know how uh, extremely sharp a uh, high heel shoe can be, and sometimes fairly heavy women, like you know, you can have a woman that weighs 300 pounds that's wearing high heel shoes, and she might rock back on one heel. So you have an extremely intense localized force. If this were concrete, there'd be a cone of percussion that would tend to break out like this. Um, if it was steel, it would probably tend to warp and deflect, but we don't really have steel floors. If it's wood, um, the, the damage pattern will be much less clean. This, by the way, is called a cone of percussion, and it's a tension failure that would occur in some material like concrete. So when we design floors, we almost we always make them thick enough that they can withstand this extremely localized force. And this failure mode is called punch through. Once the effect of the concentrated force has been accounted for, the analysis of the decking can be carried out, assuming that the live load is uniformly distributed. So in some sense, we we uh, represent human beings distributed over the floor as if they were reduced down to a pool of water that's uniformly distributed everywhere. So here we have an example we're going to talk about to sort of trace forces and pressure down through a system. And I hope that this is clear, but this represents the upper part of a stud wall in a house, for example. Here we have uh, some uh, two by 10 joists that are coming to bear on that wall. So there's some pressure between the bottom side of this joist and the top side of the wall. And um, we have a series of these joists. In this case, we've spaced them 24 inches on center, which is probably not the most common for floors, but actually works quite well if you have a three quarter inch thick plywood uh, sheet floor, which can span the 24 inches between those uh, elements. And we also, by the way, it's common to use 
24 inches between the rafters on the roof. Less common on floors where we usually use 16 inches on center. But for the purposes of this problem, we have two 2x10s two, two that are 24 inches on center resting on this wall. These are spanning 12 feet. There's another wall in the background there. And you'll notice these dashed lines are intended to represent to slice out a representative uh, portion of the floor. So you can think of this plywood as spanning across the top of this joist and it's supporting um, a portion of floor halfway to the next joist and halfway to the next joist in the opposite direction. So we can bring that dash portion out and it's drawn down below here um, for purposes our, of our analysis. So we have a 24 inch wide piece of plywood with the appropriate live load on the top. Now, this layer of water is the static equivalent of live load. For a residence, um, that load on the floor is typically taken to be 40 pounds a square foot. So we're saying the distributed live load on the floor decking is 40 pounds a square foot. The floor decking is 0.75 inches thick plywood which will, we're going to take its density to be, to be about 35 pounds a cubic foot. Uh, by the way, almost all structural woods are between 30 and 35 pounds a cubic foot. We can get hardwoods, but we don't build buildings out of hardwood. Um, we typically use softwood, which is much less expensive and quite satisfactory from a structural point of view. Plywood, because it has glue in it, is, tends to be more on the dense end, so we're calling it 35 pounds a cubic foot. The joist is solid sawn lumber. 2 by 10 is its nominal dimension, but after it shrinks during the curing process and gets planed down, its actual dimensions are 1.5 inch by 9.25. And we're going to take its density as being more towards the lower end of the range at about 30 pounds a cubic foot. Again, the spacing of the joist is 24 inches on center. The length of the joist is 12 feet. And the bearing wall thickness is 3.5 inches. All right, so we're going to draw this picture, and you don't actually have scale as you look at this in the video, but in this picture, these arrows were originally drawn at one quarter inch long, and they're supposed to represent the live load of 40 pounds a square foot, which is the area distributed equivalent uh, live load when you really pack people into the space. Uh, just to calibrate yourself, you might ask yourself uh, how much space a 200-pound person might have uh, and then try to visualize how many people that is in a room. It's a very substantial number of people. It's extremely rare in any residential situation that we would have that many people in a room that we would reach 40 pounds a square foot. And then we have safety factors on top of that, so generally our floors are pretty safe. Nonetheless, that 40 pounds a square foot is represented by arrows a quarter of an inch long, and we're going to use that as a scaling factor all the way through here. And as I said, you can't scale it off when you see this in a video, but you will see the relative magnitudes of various pressures um, as we go down through this system. So now we can calculate the area distributed load associated with the plywood. Um, and that would involve the plywood weight over the plywood area. And so the pressure is the weight of the plywood. Um, and by the way, this is not a pressure that's ever really manifest anywhere. So rather than call this a pressure, I'm just going to say it's the area distributed weight of the plywood, which is the weight of the plywood divided by the area of the plywood. And that weight is the plywood density times the plywood volume. And we said the plywood density is 35 pounds a cubic foot. And we're going to just take a one square foot sample because that makes our arithmetic equal, easy. Then the plywood area is one square foot. And then when we go to calculate the volume, it's one foot by one foot times the thickness of it. So this is the classic calculation for the dimension of a rectangular volume. And then we want to make some conversions here. We, we want to keep clean units. And what we're going to do is we're going to do everything in pounds and feet throughout this exercise. 
So here we have that the thickness is 0.75 inches and we want to clean that up and put it in feet so that as many of these feet units as possible will cancel out. So we're going to multiply by, and I'm putting in brackets here, square brackets, another way of writing one. So I'm saying I want to have an inch into the denominator to cancel that. And by the way, I can multiply anything by one and not change its value. So the game I'm playing here is finding different ways of writing one, which will help clean up units. So I want to get rid of inches. So I'm going to put an inch down the denominator and I want to convert it to feet. So I'm going to put a foot up above and I know one foot is equal to 12 inches. So what appears inside of this square bracket is another value of one. And now I've structured all this so I can clean up the units. I've got inches dividing out inches and now I'm left with feet cubed here and then I got a feet cubed there. So that feet cubed cancels out that feet cubed, but I still have those feet squared in the denominator. But then when I multiply 35 times 1 times 1 times 0.75 and divide by 12, I get 2.19 pounds per square foot. And most of you who have ever worked with plywood will say, well, that sounds about right based on my experience. All right, so we can now... Um, rearrange this image if we want to and we can combine that area uh, distributed weight of the plywood along with the area distributed pressure of the water on the top of the plywood. So we had 40 pounds a square foot plus 2.19 and now when we go scale that we're going to scale it with the following factor. In the original drawing, we made these arrows one quarter of an inch deep, and they represented 40 pounds a square foot. So the arrow scaling factor is 0.25 inches divided by 40 pounds per square foot. Or in other words, in setting the length of those arrows, this was our, our scaling factor, 0 0.00625 inches of arrow per pound per square foot. So take some time to think about that. But you know that has to be true because in this drawing we made these arrows a quarter of an inch long and they represented 40 pounds a square foot. So if I have some other pressure that I want to express or some area distributed force, I want the arrows to be scaled consistently. So I take whatever the length of those arrows was, which is 0.25 inches, I divide by the area distributed force that they represent, and when I divide 40 into 0.25, I get 0 0.00625. So now I've got a P total, which is the area distributed force of the live load, or this equivalent volume of water, which represents the people, which we've now taken out of the thing because we've accounted for localized effects like punch through. We got that 40 pounds a square foot of live load, plus the 2.19 pounds per square foot for the plywood and we add those together and we have an, an equivalent of 42.19 pounds per square foot of uh, area distributed force associated with both live load plus the plywood. If we go and we use this scaling factor and we multiply this scaling factor times this pressure we will get 0.0625 inches per pound per foot times 42.19 pounds per square foot. And the pounds per square foot here cancel those and we get an arrow of length 0 0.265, 2.264 inches. So this was very little larger than that was. And this arrow is only slightly larger than the original quarter inch long arrows. Um, but it's very consistent because we're using the same scaling factor in every case to get the appropriate length of the arrows that we're trying to represent. All right, so now we draw those arrows again. They're 0.624 inches long. And if we say it's 42 point pounds per square foot times 2 feet times 12 feet, when we multiply that out, we get an equivalent downward total force of 1,013 pounds. Now, 
there has to be something pushing up on the bottom of that decking that's equal in magnitude. Otherwise, the decking will either fall down or rise up out of the uh, in the air because it's not in equilibrium. So the downward force of 10 of 1,013 pounds has to be uh, resisted by an equivalent upward force of 1,013 pounds, which is being exerted by the top surface of the joist down below. And so we're showing some arrows that represent that. Um, we're going to go show on the next page where we got things like this number of 675 pounds per square foot. So the total downward force of gravity on the water and the plywood is, as we just said, 42.19 pounds per square foot times 24 inches, or we could have said 2 feet times 12 feet. But we wrote 24 inches, so we need to convert that inches to feet. So inside of the square bracket, we've written 1 again as feet per 12 inches to cancel out that inch with this inch, and then we will have converted everything to feet. So we have feet squared below, feet squared in the numerator. They cancel out, and we're left with pure force in pounds of 1,013 pounds. Then we say to keep the deck in equilibrium, the joist must be exerting an upward force of this magnitude on the bottom of the decking. And the pressure associated with that upward force would be the magnitude of that force divided by the area of the top of the joist, because the area of the top of the joist is the area over which that interaction is occurring, and there's only pressure on the bottom of the plywood where the top of the joist is engaging the plywood. So that, air, that force, we've said, is 1,013 pounds upwards. The area of the top of the joist is 1.5 inches times 12 feet. Again, we're going to throw in a conversion factor here that's the equivalent of 1, so we can cancel that inch out with that inch, and we're left feet with feet squared below. So the pressure is 675 pounds per square foot. And now we choose a scaling factor again, which is 0 0.00625 inches per pound per square foot. And we multiply that times the 675 pounds per square foot. The pounds per square foot cancel out, and we're left with 4.22 inches. So now when we draw this, these arrows are 0.264 high. These arrows are, are 4.22 inches. So you can see the 4.22 inch arrows are substantially larger than the 0.264 inch arrows. And so because we've taken the area and we've reduced it down from 24 inches wide to 1.5 inches wide, we see a pretty drastic increase in pressure in order to make sure that the downward force of 1,013 pounds is equal to the upward force of 1,013 pounds. So you begin to get the sense that we've amplified the pressure quite a bit by narrowing things down to the to the thickness or the width of the top of the joist. Now we can say by action reaction pairs if that's the pressure that the top of the joist is exerting on the bottom of the plywood then the plywood has to be exerting the same pressure down on the top of the joist. So in this case we were drawing arrows up on the bottom of the plywood which are the influence of the top of the joist on the bottom of the plywood, then by what we call action-reaction pairs, if the joist is pressing up against the bottom with that pressure up against the bottom of the plywood, then the plywood is pressing down on the top of the joist with that same pressure of 675 pounds per square foot. And at some point, by the way, we would tend to convert to per pounds per, per square inch but because we want to see sort of things in relative terms, we're going to stick with consistent units of pounds per square foot. So all of that is producing a downward force of 1,013 pounds on the top of this joist. So now we're going to account for the weight of the joist. We said its density is 30 pounds per cubic foot. Its volume is 1.5 inches wide by 9.25 inches deep by 12 feet long. 
and again we've got some inches here we want to get rid of so we put 12 inches and 12 inches inside of the square brackets to make sure whatever is inside here is one so we're not changing the value of things again we're going to put one foot over 12 inches which is a way of writing one we can now cancel out that inch with that and that inch with that and we're left with feet squared above or excuse me feet cubed feet cubed in the denominator so they cancel out and the weight of the joist is 34.7 pounds and most of you who have done any kind of building or construction on the residential scale are not surprised a 2 by 10 by 12 feet long is you know it's it's heavy enough you notice it but it's not unbearably difficult you can manage a 35 pound board so the total downward force of gravity causing the joist to move downward is the live load plus the weight of the plywood plus the weight of the joist from previous calculations we know the live load force plus the weight of the plywood is 1,013 pounds then we add to that the weight of the joist and we get 1,047.7 pounds and by the way if you take a science course they'll say this is absurd to write this out to this degree I just do it because it's easy for me to correct your answers if I have enough uh, units there I can round mine off so anybody who wants to they could call this 1,048 we're not going to be a stickler about that in this class but you really do need at least three significant figures okay so accounting for the total downward force of 1048 for the water plywood decking and joist the pressure on the bottom of the joist being caused by the wall that wall has to be the two walls have to be pushing up with a total force of 1048 pounds so we're going to take one wall and we're going to say it's pushing up with half that force. So we take the 1,048 pounds, we divide it by two, and that's the force that the wall is exerting on the underside of the joist at one end. And that is distributed over the intersection area, which is the width of the joist times the width of the wall. That's the only place where there's any pressure exerted between the two so all of this pressure that we're calculating has to occur over that little area again we have conversion factors to get rid of the inches 12 inches per foot 12 inches per foot this inch cancels that one that inch cancels that one and we're left with 14,373 pounds per square foot so if we graph that in terms of the pressures on the joist you see you've got 675 pounds per square foot downward due to the pressure of the plywood on the top of the joist and that 675 by the way is compared to 14,373 pounds per square foot so the pressure is increasing quite seriously as we carve out space in other words we're spanning between the joist and the joists are spanning between the walls and that's how we create architecture as we have highly distributed forces which we carry off to columns and when we do that we're basically reducing the cross-sectional area of material through which these forces are transmitted and as a consequence pressures start to increase we plot these here but they won't fit on the page uh, but they're quite long so this says the uh, length of those arrows would be 20.6 times as long as the downward pressure arrows on the top of the joist so they're big okay so typically you know if we have a situation like that we've just described what's happening at this interface what's interesting of course is if you carry those loads down here to there we've now got all the loads from up above plus the loads from this representative floor so we've doubled those loads and then we're going to triple them by the time we get down to here and so we ask ourselves how bad is that and the truth is that even with a two-story high building we don't crush the ends of these joists um, even though the pressures are beginning to mount up 
Where we run into trouble is when we start removing windows because then if we try to carry all those loads down through this one joist, we will crush the ends because here we're collecting load over this entire distance from this level and that level and concentrating them all on that joist. So when we do that, we'll put some blocking pieces in here um, just to keep from crushing that end of the joist. But you, when you start opening up windows like this or big uh, sliding doors or whatever and concentrating all these loads into a very small uh, vertical member, you start to have very high stresses. So that concludes our uh, video on units of measure. This is chapter two, section one. Chapter two is devoted to loads on buildings.